Thank you, Brother Gaston. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Ephesians this morning. The book of Ephesians, chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5, the title of the message is, Awake, Arise, Understand. Awake, Arise, Understand. There's just one verse that I really want to hone in on, and that is verse number 14. Ephesians 5, verse number 14 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. Let me read that verse again. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. The he in that Bible verse, I take it to be God. God is saying, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Paul is actually then relaying a message from God directly to the Ephesians. Best I can tell, this is not an Old Testament quote. Uh, it's not a verse that he's going back into the Old Testament and just re-preaching now to these group of people. It seems as though this is a new revelation. Or maybe it's part of an Old Testament passage that he has revised to apply to a new situation. But in this section, he's trying to help the Ephesians, the Christians, to understand that there's some task that they need to do. As a matter of fact, this is really just the third of his points. What he's doing in this section is he's describing the condition of the lost. He's describing also the work of the Christians. And then he's describing the urgency of the task. Look back up in verse number 11, if you would, and notice the condition of the lost. Verse number 11, he says, and have no fellowship. Excuse me. Verse number 12, if you would, please. Look at verse number 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. He's describing there the lost. He says, we can't even talk about the things that the lost world does. He says, the things that they do is so bad, we can't even mention them in public. Then he also goes up and describes our task. He does that back up in verse number 12, the verse that I tried to read just a moment ago. Uh, Verse number 11, let me get my verses correct. He says, and have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So he's describing the condition of the lost. Then he tells us what our task is. What's our task? Our task is not to condone the wickedness that's going on in the world. It's certainly not to compromise with it, not to get involved in it. It's, it's really not even just to endure it. He says our job is to reprove it. To reprove means to correct we're to correct the lost. A lot of people think, well, we're supposed to be like Christ. We're supposed to love folks in their sin. And yes, we are. We should always be kind. We should always be gracious. We should always be loving. Those things we should always be. But at the same time, we have to be reprovers. We have to be clear. We have to be direct. We have to be blunt. Why? Because that's our task. That's what God has called us to do is to reprove the lost world. So he tells us first the condition of the lost. He tells us what our task is. And then he describes in verse number 14 the urgency of our task. He says, we need to awake, we need to arise, and we need to understand. This morning for a few moments, if I can get my verses straight, let's look at those three commands that he gives us in those verses. The first command that he gives to us is awake. Wake up. Now really that's pretty serious. Because what he's already described in the two verses up above is that the world's doing such things, such abominable things that we can't even talk about them. And that the Christian's role in that is to reprove them, to correct them. But instead of the church being the corrector, he's describing the church as being asleep. So the command that he's uttering is, wake up, there's a task that the church needs to be doing. I don't know about you, but I enjoy sleep. I try not to overdo it, but it's good at the end of a long day to have a good night's sleep. Somebody might think, well, what's the problem with sleeping? What, what's wrong with being asleep? Even if the world's going to hell, what's wrong with us sleeping through it? Well, several thoughts come to my mind. First of all, if you're asleep, you're really unaware of what's going on around you. You know, when you go to sleep at night, you don't even know if it rains. Not, not if you're a good sleeper. You don't know if it rains. You don't know if the wind comes. Uh, your mate might get up out of the bed and be gone for a while and come back in, and you don't know about it. You're, a, you're oblivious to all that. 
the alarm might ring the next morning and you might not even catch that. I mean, that's, that's what we call a very good sleep. We all need that kind of a sleep. But there's dangers. There's dangers with having that kind of a sleep. Smoke detector might also go off. Might not hear that. A burglar might break into your house. You might not hear that. In Alabama, the tornado alarm system might go off and you might not hear that. Why? Because when we're sleeping, we're just unaware of anything else and literally everything else that's going on around us. Jesus actually rebuked the Jews about this. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 16, verses 2 and 3. Uh, you don't need to turn there. Hopefully I've got it in my notes. He says in verse number 2, He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? Now, he's talking to his own people. And he's saying, you guys, you're smart when it comes to the weather. You can tell by the clouds and by what the atmosphere looks like what's going to take place that day. Whether it's going to be a clear day or whether it's going to be a cloudy day, you can tell that. But you're oblivious. You have no awareness of the signs of the time. You have no knowledge of what's going on around you. Why? Because you're asleep. It's a sad situation to be spiritually asleep. It's sad for the lost. You know, the lost are so soundly asleep, they don't know they're lost. Jesus gave a parable in the book of Luke, chapter number 18, about two guys that go up to the temple to pray. And, and one guy is praying, and one guy is just over in the corner and he's just beating on his chest, just saying, God, please be merciful to me. I'm just, I'm just a sinner. But the guy who's praying out loud prays something like this. He says, God, I'm glad I'm not like everybody else. I'm not an extortioner. And I'm not unjust, and I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even like that old sinner over there. Uh, I tithe, and I pray, and I, uh, I, I, I go to church. And then Jesus asked the question. He says, when those two people leave the temple that day, which one of them do you think it's going to leave more righteous. It's interesting he doesn't answer that, but I think you kind of get the idea. The guy who beat on his chest understood he was a sinner. The guy who was standing upright and praying, he had no idea just how abominable he was in the process. Why? Because he's asleep. People that are asleep don't know what's taking place around them. They don't know that they're lost. They don't know that there's a hell. To be honest, there's a lot of people that are so deeply asleep, they don't even know they're going to die. To them, it happens to everybody else, but it's so far pushed away from them because they're asleep that it doesn't even ring true in the depths of their mind, in the depths of their soul. But now, wait a minute, we're not reading in the gospel. We're reading the epistles. Uh, Paul is not teaching to the lost people, he's teaching to the saved folks. This isn't a gospel for evangelism. This is an epistle for teaching. Paul's not calling the lost asleep. He's calling the saved asleep. The same unawareness that takes place in the lost world, it takes place in the saved world too. As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, chapter number 3, verse number 17, Jesus himself talks to the Christians about being asleep. Verse 17 of Revelation 3, he says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He's talking to the church. But the church doesn't realize just how wretched they are. They don't realize how poor they are. They don't realize how naked they are. Why? Because they are asleep. Now here's the problem. When we're asleep, we can't do what God has called us to do. We can't give aid and rescue to those that are lost because we're totally unaware of what's taking place around us. Paul in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 14 tells us what God said. He's quoting God. He says, God says to us, wake up. Wake up. Why? Because when we're asleep, we're totally unaware of what's taking place around us. Wake up, why? Because when we're asleep, we typically prefer the darkness. Now, some of you may be day sleepers, but most people 
prefer to sleep in the dark. As a matter of fact, even day sleepers, you probably make the room just as dark as you can because it's much easier to sleep in the darkness, much more easier than it is to sleep in the daylight. Science has proven that scientifically we need to sleep in the dark. Uh, I've got an article here that's actually several years older. The, the title of the article is 29 Secrets to a Good Night's Sleep. Number four, let me read it to you. It says you need to sleep in complete darkness or as close as possible. If there is even the tiniest light in the room, it can disrupt your uh, circadian rhythm and your pineal glands reproduction of melatonin and serotonin. There also should be as little light in the bathroom as possible if you get up in the middle of the night. Please, whatever you do, keep the light off when you go to the bathroom at night. As soon as you turn that light on uh, for the rest of that night, your body immediately ceases all production of the important sleep aid, melatonin. What does science tell us? It tells us we need to be in the dark. It's natural. It's needful for us to be in the dark. But just like sleepers prefer the dark, sinners prefer the dark. Uh, darkness in the Bible is a picture of being without truth, being without Christ, being even without understanding. So as Christians who are asleep, not only are we unaware of what's taking place around us, but we're more than likely preferring to be without our Savior, to be without the truth, without sanctity, without the things that are pure and the things that are holy. The world that we're living in is changing. It's changing very rapidly. There was a time when most people did their sinning in the dark. They were ashamed of it. And then a few years ago, and I'm saying a few years, it's probably been a few decades ago now, they, they, they kind of came out of the closet. I mean, that was the phrase, and, and not just with homosexuality, but with all sins. For a while there, they were, and they still are parading down Main Street, but now we're, we're, we're moving over to the third phase, and the third phase is they're trying to put out everybody else's light as well. Things are changing so much. Why? In part because even the Christians are asleep. And those that are asleep, Prefer the darkness. Christ's command, God's command, what Paul is relating to us is the command of God. What is that command? We need to awake. The command is we need to wake up. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, sleep's needful. Sleep's actually nourishing. Sleep's natural. And actually when we sleep, it is. However, the sleep that the world is involved in today is not needful, it's not natural, and it's not nourishing. It's actually sin-induced. There's another word found in verse number 14. Go back and look at verse number 14. It's part of the second command that he gives, but the text that he gives to us in verse number 14 is, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. Now, again, he's not talking to the lost, he's talking to the saved. But he's describing that the sleep that the, the saved are sleeping is a sin-induced supernatural death. He's not talking to the unsaved. He's talking to the saved. He's not talking to a wicked church. He's talking to a good church. The church at Ephesus was one of Paul's best churches. It was the church where he spent two years there. It was the church when he knew he would never pass by again. He went out of his way to set up a meet with the leaders of the church just so that he could pray with them and speak to them one more time. When Paul writes this epistle, he's not writing to a church like Corinth to correct them. He's writing a church to remind them of how much he loves them, but still... He acknowledges that inside that church there's people that are sound asleep and they're sleeping the sleep of death. It's as if Satan had gotten a hold of them and put blinders on their eyes. They're completely unaware of what's going on around them. They're completely asleep to what's happening, incapable of doing what God's called them to do. And the command that he gives is, wake up. Awake. If God has a message for the Christians today, the message would be, awake. That's the first command that he gives, but there is a second command that he gives. The second command he gives, we just read a part of it. He says, first of all, you need to awake, but secondly, you need to arise. So first he says, you need to wake up. Then he says, number two, you need to get up. Uh, these Christians were asleep, and probably 
sleeping in a reclining position, probably sleeping in a laying position. Again, I've got nothing, nothing against sleeping at all. I like to do it. I think it's a good pastime. At least six, seven, eight hours a day, I think Christians ought to sleep. But he's also telling us there comes a time when we have to wake up. Just like it's natural to sleep, it's natural to wake up. Just like it's natural to lay down, it's natural to get up. There are some things you can do in the reclining position. Some things that are pretty good. You can pray in the reclining position. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you to pray. Before you ever get up in the morning, spend some time praying. Before your feet ever touch the ground, uh, you might want to roll out of the bed and just roll over on your knees. That's great and good. But even if you don't want to do that, just lay on your back and before you ever get up out of the bed in the morning, just spend some time talking to God. You might find out that might be your sweetest time of communion with God. Prayer is important. Prayer is necessary. Prayer ought to be the first thing that we do. You can pray in the reclining position. However, you need to also understand that if you pray long enough, if you pray earnestly enough, sooner or later, God's going to tell you that you need to get up and go do something. See, prayer is not just us talking to God. Prayer is also God talking back to us. The old saints used to say, you need to put some feet to your prayers. Yes, you do need to pray. You need to spend much time in prayer. You don't need to do anything else until you have prayed, but you do need to do more than just pray. So you can pray from a reclining position. That's a good thing. First thing to do. Good place to start. You can think from a reclining position. Now, you may not believe it, but I like to think too. I like to sleep. I like to think. As a matter of fact, the older I get, the more I think and the less I do. I'm not sure, but maybe that's the new definition of laziness. However, I've never been one who liked to jump into something and see how it worked out. I want to kind of stand back. I want to figure out what I need to do. I want to see how this is going to lay out. I kind of want to get the details in my mind. If this happens, I'll be able to do this. I like to spend some time thinking. And, and by the way, that's a pretty good practice. You don't want to just think. But there's nothing wrong with being in a reclining position and thinking things through. But again, if all you do is think and you never do anything, then nothing will ever get done. You'll have plenty of ideas, you'll have plenty of goals, maybe plenty of ambitions. But as far as the reality of what you've thought about, nothing will become of it. There's a lot of good things you can do when you're laying down. You can pray, you can think, you can cheer. Man, from a laying down position, you can cheer. Somebody called yesterday where I was at. For some reason, my phones weren't working. And so they just left a message. A lady called and, and the message was two minutes and 45 seconds. I noticed the length of the time of it, and that whole message was just a message of encouragement. This lady was just going on and on about how she wanted me to know that she appreciated this and she appreciated that. Boy, those are the kind I'm going to say for a while. Everybody needs a cheerleader. Everybody needs somebody to say, man, that was a good job. Man, you did good. You need to hang in there. You're doing what God wants. Everybody needs a cheerleader. But no matter how many good things you can do from a reclining position. In the end, from a reclining position, all you can really do is watch what's taking place around you. If you really want to get involved in the things of Christ, then you have to follow the commands that he gives. The first command is you have to wake up, but then number two, you've got to get up. You've got to arise in order to do what God wants you to to do. I know I keep mentioning it, but it's because it's an important thing this year. Our thing this year is more. 20, 2019, we want to do more. We want to be more for Jesus. More worship, more devotion, more giving, more witnessing. And maybe you could think of some more things that you need to put onto that list of more. Those are just the first four or the important four that came to my mind. Every single Christian has to make a decision. Whether you're going to be a sleeping saint or a serving saint. Whether you're going to be a reclining saint or a revived saint. Whether you're going to be a omitting saint or an obedient saint. Those who will not get up will never accomplish anything for Jesus Christ. Paul's got a command, three commands that he's given. He's looked at the situation. He says, the world's lost. They're doing things that are so bad we can't even discuss them. The Christians are supposed to be the reprovers, the ones that speak to them about these. Lovingly, yes. Graciously, yes. But bluntly, yes. The problem is they're asleep. 
They need to, number one, wake up. They need to, number two, get up. And then they need to, number three, to understand. That verse again, it's verse number 14. He says, arise, O sleeper. Awake, O sleeper. Arise, and Christ shall give thee light. Light's understanding. Light's truth. Light is knowledge. The thought there is, if you'll obey the first two commands, the first command is wake up, second command is get up, then you'll begin to see what's going on around you and you'll begin to understand what's going on around you. I'm really not sure that even folks inside the church today are understanding just how bad things have gotten. We're not understanding because we're asleep. You say, well, preacher, what things do we need to understand? We need to understand that Satan is in control and that Satan has flying his colors. It's not just that he's in control. Let's face it, he's always been in control. This world's been his since Adam and Eve lost it in the fall. But never has he raised his colors as high as he's raising them today. To be honest with you, I can't see anything that Satan's not controlling now. I spent some time trying to go through several elements. I thought about the school, and and, and I love schools. I appreciate the difficulty that schools are having today. But you know, if, if your school, your child's school, is teaching evolution without creation, if they're teaching alternate lifestyles, if they're teaching pick your own gender, if they're if they're giving condoms to the kids, if they're teaching a Christless American history, then let's face it, it doesn't matter how sweet the teacher is, that school is being controlled by the devil himself. I mean, you couldn't get a better propaganda machine if you were to build it for Satan. And then you begin to think about what takes place inside the schools today, the bullying that goes on the sex that goes on, the drugs that go on, the suicides that go on. You know what we have turned our schools into? We've turned them into prisons. We've, somewhere along the line, we've lost the notion of educating our kids, and the only thing we want to do is give them a diploma. We put them in this prison for 12 to 14 to 16 years, and the devil is the warden. And then we wonder why our kids are coming out the way that they're coming out. Friend, it's a Terrible situation. And it's not because there's not good folks in the school. There are. There's some great principals. There's some great teachers. There's some great helpers. But the devil's just controlling everything else. You look at television. I mean, can you see any wholesomeness in our entertainment at all anymore? Can you, can you see any purity? Can you see any godliness in the music, in the movies? Can you see it in, can you see it in the news? Can, can, can you see it in the politics? Can you see it even in the churches? So many of our churches today, even inside the religious establishments, Satan is in control. You say, preacher, you're trying to scare us? Yeah, I guess I kind of am because we're asleep. We're not realizing just how bad things have got. The devil's always been there, but never has he had as much control Never has he been so glorified. Never has God been so villain, villainized as what's taking place in this world today. We need to understand Satan's not just in control. He's hoisted his colors. We need to understand that we're living in the last times. That's what the Bible said would happen in these days. We're there now. There's really nothing else that we need to expect. Yes, it will get worse But what new things can there be? The only thing that's left is massive persecution of the church. And as I said a few moments ago, we're moving that way. We've gone from using the closet for our sins to parading them down Main Street to now the next thing is they want to put out the light. Whatever light there is that acts as a reprover, a corrector, a rebuker, soon in all countries... They'll want to vanquish that light. I think last week I mentioned the killing in 
I said it was in Australia. I correct myself, it was in New Zealand. 49 Muslims, I think, were killed. They talk about a white supremacist, a white right-winger. And I don't know. We're not for that. No matter who does it, we're not for that. God doesn't teach us to do it that way. And I never know whether Facebook's true or not. You know, it's, there's a lot of junk on Facebook. But since that time, I have found, noticed several people posting that 200 Christians were killed here and 400 Christians were killed over here. and So many Christians were killed over here. And then they'll put, and no media coverage at all. And you know what I'm realizing? Is that we may not be losing our lives in the United States of America for Jesus Christ, but man, they're losing their lives for Jesus Christ in almost every other corner of the globe. Why? We're living in the last times. They're not just wanting to come out of the closet now. They want to turn off the light. These are the last days. We need to understand some things. Christ shall give thee light. What should we understand? The devil's in control. We're in the last days. We need to understand this world's not our home. Somebody said, well, preacher, I'd, I'd like to wake up. I'd like to get up. I, I'd like to do more things, but it would cost me. It would cost me. It'd probably cost me my job. It would cost me tenure. It would cost me maybe my, my possessions. It might cost me friendships. You know, you have to stop at some point and really ask yourself, what are we willing to lose to keep the little that we have? I'm going to tell you something I think it's true. I can't promise it's true. But I think if what takes place every day in our school system here was taking place 50 years ago. I think our parents, I think my parents and my grandparents would have showed up on the steps of the school and they'd either snatch me out of that place quicker than your head could spin or else they'd be sitting in every single classroom in every single hallway with a gun in their lap and anybody that tried to mess with their kids, they'd do something about it. But we've gotten to the place like the frog on the stove where slowly the heat gets getting turned up more and more and the water's beginning to boil around us. And because it happens so slowly, we're not really responding to it. And I got a notion, we need to step back, wake up, get up, and understand. Because we're really not getting very much for all that we're putting up with. This country that we live in, it was purchased by the blood of those who gave everything so that we might have it. I mean, gave everything. And as they say from time to time on Veterans Day and Memorials Day, and every so often there has to be a fresh application of the blood of Americans. And that's sad, but it's true. In order to maintain freedom, somebody has to give up their life to fight for it. But do you realize for all the Americans that have died for their country, and I'm respectful of everyone, but for all the Americans that have died for their country, that's just a small fraction of the numbers of Christians who have died for their Savior. America's only 240, 250 years old. The gospel's over 2,000 years old. We fought some conflicts when it, as many as 20, 30, 40, 50, civil wars, 60, 70,000 Americans may have died. But there were years, 100,000, 200,000, million Christians died for Jesus Christ. At what point do we as believers quit trying to hold their treasures as our treasures and do what Paul was teaching the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5. Wake up, get up, and understand. I'm to the place where I'm believing that one of three things is going to have to happen soon. I've always said one of two things. I said either we're going to have to have a, a revival or we're going to have to have a rapture. But as I've been thinking about it a little bit later, I think there is a third option. We can either have a revolt, a revival, or a rapture. Uh, by revolt, I don't mean something that Christians start. Uh, I, I'm thinking that the lost world is going to cast us into anarchy. We could have a major revolt against authority, and I, I think we're kind of moving that way 
So we could have something like that. We could have a revival or we could have a rapture. I'll be honest, I've always rooted for the, for the revival. Part of me wants to root for the rapture, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for the revival because I want to see God do something miraculous again. I want to see the Holy Ghost descend. I want to see souls get saved. I want to see the church ignite a flame and a fire for God once again. I'd love to see that. But even if it's to be the revolt and ultimately the rapture, I don't want the rapture to take place and me be asleep. I don't want the rapture to take place and the bride to be taken off this planet. Those that are saved and, and have said, we slept the last 10 years. We slept the last 20 years. We did nothing for Jesus. Man, I'd rather, I'd rather die in the revolt than to fly out asleep in the rapture. I want to see what Paul said we need to be. He's given us three commands. Wake up. Wake up. Get up. You can't do anything from a reclining position. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's a contact sport. And when you wake up and get up, then Christ will give you some light. Then you will understand what's taking place around you. Then you will see the whole picture. The commands that he gives are to the body of Christ because we're, we have a task to do. What's the task? The task that Christ has called us to do is to be a reprover of this world. It'll cost you something to be that reprover. You should always be courteous. You should always be gracious. You should always be loving and kind. But if we lay down our task to reprove the world, then we cease to be the solution to the problems. And we begin to be the worst part of the problem. You and I have been called to awake, to arise, and to understand. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the attention of the people. Though my lips and my mind have not been capable of explaining as clearly as I would have liked, I pray, God, that the Spirit of God would take the Word of God and would accomplish something that only the Holy Ghost of God can do. You do your will, your work in this hour. We'll do our best to give you the praise for what you do. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake.